On this week in sales, we'll be looking at a new study that shows that 60% of sales coaching is random or informal. We're going to get Victor's opinion on how random or informal sales coaching and training should be in a second. We're going to look at why 80% of B2B interactions between suppliers and buyers will occur in the digital channels in 2025 onwards. We're going to ask if, well, do tattoos matter? Should should a tattoo stop you getting a sales job? Should, should should you tattoo your brand's logo on your face? Will that lead to more conversions and more sales? And is there Does a new- Does Will have a tattoo? Does Will have a tattoo? We're going to find out. I've, I've got that question written down to ask you as well, Victor. We'll cover, we'll cover that in a second. And finally, is there a new sales role coming? The VP of Pipeline. We'll get Victor's and my opinions on that. So, Victor, let's get started with this news from CSO Insights about- sales coaching and essentially it being non-existent. If something's informal, if something isn't planned, does it really exist? It does not. It's not going to happen. And it's random ad hoc. But it, it's interesting. How many companies have you worked for as a salesperson, Will, before I jump into the article, yep. where you actually had a formal coaching session? Think back on that. So, so it depends. What, so it is, is a, uh, probably the starting point. How do you define a coaching session, Victor? Every Friday, we get together at two o'clock to review your pipeline. <laughs> I've never had that. I've had I've oh. had a pipeline review I, once a quarter, which was basically I, a, a rollicking that I hadn't done this or I should do that. But I've never had someone sit down and say, I'm going to help you suss out what the plan is. What was that word? Suss out? Suss out. Uh, like work out a plan, work together. This is where that UK, you know, <laughs> American thing really kind of hampers us a little bit. Suss out. So like, <laughs> just thinking, you used the phrase last week, uh, was it ball breaker or something like that? I, I, someone being a ball ache. Ball ache. That's, <laughs> which kind of go, kind of sounds like, well, you said ball ache. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what threw me off a little bit. But anyway, that's just me. So anyway, so this, this, this study by CSO Insights, you'll find it on their blog. It's called, uh, basically says, uh, it's after all this time, do we, st do we still need to fix coaching? Lack of formal coaching today after more than two decades of bemoaning. Now there's a word, Will. Mm -hmm. Bemoaning. Uh, the opportunity cost of incomplete or ineffective coaching formality is lacking. In fact, 60% of more than the 900 sales organizations in the fifth annual sales enablement study still use a random or informal process. Now, again, we all... You know, it, it's interesting, you know, you know, Daniel Pink has a statement that says uh, there's what science says and what businesses do. Hmm. I always like that phrase, what science says and businesses do. And the science says that coaching matters. I think the average is two to three hours per month to really be effective. And but yet businesses don't do it. And I always go, why is it? Why is it? Well, why, why, why do you think they don't do it? OK, so I have I'll I'll prerequisite this. I've got very minimal management kind of experience other than managing our team, which is about eight of us now over at salesman.org. So, and it's all done remotely. So to answer your question, Victor, I think in my opinion, so I'm talking about this from my opinion as someone on the ground floor as a salesperson, right? I think that a lot of managers don't really care about the success of the salespeople. They only care to the point of that they want to hit their own targets. And so if someone's hitting the target, if they're close to hitting the target, then they're going to focus on people that you know aren't getting uh, aren't getting the numbers, and and then eventually just sack them rather than really. I know this sounds cliche, right? But are, really but investing but in the team. Isn't that intertwined? Well, well of you course, know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pointing out the obvious. There it is, Victor. The obvious. And, and so I, I think back of when I was a manager managing salespeople, mm -hmm. and in the spirit of full disclosure here, I didn't coach. I didn't coach and my mindset was as primitive as Neanderthal as this may sound now, uh, is that, come on, man, I hired you. I'm paying you a lot of money. You know what to do, get it done. If I got to babysit you, why did I hire you? Is that a bad attitude? I don't know. I think that's the attitude thing. that people have though, Victor, in that yeah. it's, and, and, and this doubles down. So if you then acquire a team via you know job promotion or whatever it is and you didn't hire them then you go mentally well subconsciously perhaps it's not my fault i didn't hire these suckers rather than <laughs> looking at it from if it's a you know a kid or if you're helping someone so i mentor and i hate that word but it's essentially what i do i mentor and coach a bunch of local entrepreneurs here at leeds just people i'm kind of like one or two steps ahead of in in starting a business and, and growing it 
And I really enjoy that. I get loads of value out of it. And I've what I do with them, I've never had done to me. And it's I feel maybe it's because sales managers just don't really care. Is that is that fair to say? Some yeah, sales yeah, managers. Well, it's, it's, it's like the nature nurture argument, right? It's either yeah. in you or bred into you, one of the two, right? And I've never, I can't think of, yeah, I can't think of anybody who's ever coached me. And maybe that's how we just kind of, it's we, we pay it forward that way, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how we were taught. Well, damn it, that's how you should do it then. <laughs> you know, that. <laughs> but there's just something wrong. I think if we were, if we were to design the ideal coaching scenarios, how we would do it, well, how would you do it? You're a manager, you're a manager now yep. of a large company. You got about, I don't know, 50 salespeople. Let's give you some serious responsibility there. You know, how would you approach it today? If it were magic wand, yours to do. So you've thrown me with 50 salespeople because I was going to say book a, an appointment in the calendar. It's time blocked, can never be changed. No customer can come in and, and, and scupper things. It has to be done each week. But with 50 people, I don't know if there's enough time to effectively coach 50 people. So then perhaps we're looking at investing in, in tools or technology to enable this to, to go smoothly. Is that, and I'm just guessing at this because I have no, no idea. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I would just layer on top of that. I would go with you because I don't think you, it's, it's not possible. But I also think that what you just said is true, that you can use technology. So for example, maybe I could use, you know, our metrics to determine who needs coaching because not everybody does need coaching. And so I guess I would use the technology to move us into that space. So by the way, you, you, you had an interesting question, which is uh, do sales leaders just need to outsource their training and coaching and admit that it's no longer part of their jobs? That was a great question. What say you will on that one? Well, we both own training companies, so maybe our answer is going to be slightly biased. But if you can't, if a sales manager, right, if they do not have the time to do this, if they will be beholden to the analytics and reporting up and doing all stuff that I don't really understand what sales managers do, but they seem to be, they seem to be quite busy each morning, right? then they should outsource it. And, uh, you know, there's, there's us two kind of involved in the space, but there's other people as well. One website that I, um, I'll i plug and I'll put in the show notes as well is knowyourteam.com. I think it's just created by or co-created by some of the team over at basecamp.com. And it allows you to basically set up a reoccurring email sequence that just goes to your team that pings them a question. And some of the questions are like, you know, what what's your favorite food? Do you like this? just to build that little bit of conversation. Like, so it actually happens because everyone, everyone gets too busy to, to have these conversations during the workday, even though they're important. But then you can also schedule other um, content that will go out of looking at numbers and other things as well. And there's different tools in the platform. Um, we've tried to use it uh, recently over at salesman.org and it seems to be working well. So that's perhaps one way to- I, I've, never, I've never heard of that. I'm looking at it right now. Knowyourteam.com, leadership doesn't have to be so hard. Yeah. And and there's there's good guides and content in there as well, but it's the the tools that they have that for setting up quick meetings and and basically making sure that everything's booked in the diary that seems to be effective. Yeah, I'm sympathetic to, uh, with managers uh, having been one, and that is because there's three there's three responsibilities I always say you have to have every day. One is you have to manage upwards in the organization, which mm -hmm. is manage expectations, right? Then you have to do your day to day, and then you have to look out into the field. And if we were to equally divide deals into thirds, you can quickly see that managers simply don't have a lot of time. So I would say, I would take my struggling salespeople and figure out if I can't coach them, let me find a coach for them. But figure how does this nice work, Victor, from the perspective of like, you know, Pareto's law, 80-20, would you not get a, I don't know the answer to this, but is there not a chance that you'd get higher performance across the team by focusing on the guys and girls that are absolutely crushing it and helping them level up? versus I, I focusing feel like on the I knew we were going to say that. I had like a matrix moment with you right <laughs> now. I like I knew he was going to come back with that one. Oh, we're so in line. You're right cuz most people say just keep investing in your top 20%. Mm -hmm. Right? But there might be some uh, so I always like to do the 20-60-20 rule. 20% 20 killing it, 60% just hanging in there, 20% are are truly struggling. I would invest in moving the 60% into the uh okay. the 20% range. That's how I would do it. And then the 20%, I would just test the bottom 20. I would just see if I need to either train them or replace them. But that is a good point. That is a good point. Yeah. All right. As, so, as, hey, go ahead. Uh, as I said, I've got no um, kind of uh, take take Victor's advice on this, not mine. That's all I was going to wrap up that with, Victor. <laughs> all right, man. Your turn. What does Gardner say? Gardner? 
the legends, the massive organization that is Gartner say that 80% of B2B sales interactions between buyers and suppliers, I don't know what other sales interactions they'd be monitoring, but interactions between buyers and suppliers will occur in digital channels by 2025. This is not groundbreaking news. It's pretty obvious, right? Because even a phone call, I've I've not given anyone my phone number. You do you don't even have my phone number, um, Victor. Everything I do is over Skype and digital channels. I don't do anything over anything that isn't digital anymore. That is correct. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, if we if we're going to parse what digital is, we've been using digital since we started using the phone, kind of. It was analog, but we yep. went digital yep. eventually, right? And so. I believe this to be true. And uh, before the show got started, I told you I interviewed uh, John Barrels, right? And I asked him a question along these lines about, you know, what's the future of selling? And he was talking about, you know, the great divide between, let's say, you know, the baby boomers and those who know technology, Gen Xers, millennials. And I think Gen Xers and millennials, they were born with technology. I mean, they came out of the womb with a tablet and on one hand and a, you know, a phone in the other. Um, and so I think the transition is going to be easier, but I also think that people, they don't want, customers don't want to talk to salespeople. I, and, I, and I don't think so much it's because of, hey, it's going to pressure me. I think simply because, hey, let me figure out a lot of this on my own. The information's out there. Let me go through the process. You don't have to spoon feed me. Let me go through the process. When I'm ready to talk to you, I'll reach out. But as you know, the content online becomes more high end, more descriptive, you can actually make better decisions online and that's going to drive more B2B people to make that decision online. Do we need to have people going into an account in the vast minority uh, majority of organizations, Victor? Is field sales, other than things like my background, medical device sales, where I'm literally handing the surgeon a piece of equipment during the procedure, other than the niche cases like that, is field sales basically dead? You know, it, again, bringing up John Barrels' interview, uh, and then just go to J, uh, jbarrels.com. That's his website. Good guy, sales trainer as well. And we both agree that, and he was more vehement about it. He was like, <laughs> Victor, companies are waking up. And he used the number 50%. I used the number 40%. That that VP of sales, chief sales officers are realized, wait a minute, I'm selling just as much as I was before the pandemic yep. when people were getting on a plane. Uh, and guess what? My costs are what? Down like 50% or 40%, whatever the number is. Bottom line, your cost of sales is down, which means if I'm a CSO or I'm a CEO and I got a CSO underneath, I'm going to say, why do they need to travel? I'm closing more deals. Virtual is just as good. Let's have that. And so I think that, I think to your point, uh, the, the end of face-to-face is, it, by the way, it's never going to be an absolute, right? We're never yeah, going to do it again. But I think a lot of companies are going to recalibrate that number. And Well, let me what ask you this from, from a devil's advocate perspective here, because what you just described there is true. It's correct. Um, but it is a, a selfish a motivation there on the, the side of a CSO or a VP Good of point. sales. What Good happens point. if the buyer goes, we want? you to come to our office and present to the team because doing this over zoom is a pain in the ass because sally is off this direction and, and we need unless we have this meeting where everyone's in person just nothing happens uh, yes this the, the company could call us and say come on in but i think there's a greater danger that you just kind of alluded to and that is if from a selfish standpoint i want to reduce my costs yeah you know all of a sudden my competitor could go, you know what? Yep. I'll go visit him. <laughs> Victor doesn't want to go. I'll go, you know, and all of a sudden, you know how that works. And so there, there's, a, there's a balance to be, uh, you, get, you have to strike there. But it's, it's a good question. Maybe they're going to start qualifying these trips more. Maybe now, you know, calls like on Zoom, Skype, whatever it may be, might be the ultimate qualifier before you get on the plane. Yeah, that, and that makes sense, right? I don't think that's unreasonable whatsoever. So with that, Victor, is this good or bad for salespeople? A, a career salesperson who wants to spend the next 20, 30 years of their life in, uh, you know, uh, let's let's push towards a complex B2B sale where it can't be automated and it can't be replaced by, a, you know, a PDF or a website. If someone wants to mm-hmm. invest in that career, is this good or bad for them? I think the the the, the traditional sales job as we know it today is disappearing quickly. It's like, you know, some species that's being extinguished very quietly in the savanna and you don't know about it. 
the bones are being buried type of thing. <laughs> and what's what's emerging out of the out of the uh, the primordial ooze of set of new sales is this this SDR slash account executive that's a hybrid that would rather work from inside to get the business. But if I got to travel, I'll travel. And that person will now take care of, let's say, the full sales cycle, beginning to end, one point of contact. I am him. I am her type of thing. So, what do you think? so just to clarify, you think that the SDR, a customer success is going to morph into one contact point over the you know the course of the next few years? For some if you if you say B two B complex sale, I yep. would say yes, I would say yes because all of a sudden I want to take responsibility for the full sales cycle mm -hmm. because that's how it used to be done. If you think about it, you know we had a portfolio of customers. You came from the medical device industry. You had a portfolio. You knew who you had to visit. You knew who all the players were. You knew all the players in the industry, competitors, so forth. And I think we've gotten away from that because you know we've gone into this massive bam, let's blast out content wait for the leads come in, yep. and then we'll contact them, which is why account-based marketing is now kind of making a, a resurgence, which is really B2B selling, <laughs> just more strategic with technology. Come on, let's be honest about this yeah. for a second. So I think this inside, outside might just be inside. And if I need to go outside and go get it, I will. Yeah, I agree. And I, if it does go that way, I am totally on board. So I think that's better for salespeople because then you can say, I have been here for X amount of months. I on my own without any well, obviously support from the company and whoever else, but I've generated this revenue. And so a price can be put on your head that it allows you to be commissions based because I think it's difficult to, and I, I see this trend in, in some of the conversations I've had recently, Victor, of companies are trying to pull commissions off the table and move a lot of sales roles to customer success based esque roles where you, you're basing things on the customer being happy as a, which is not unreasonable, uh, versus the amount of deals that have been done and the revenue generated. Interesting. That's an interesting, yeah, that's another topic to cover. That's an interesting <laughs> topic. I would be careful with that one though. Yeah, well, let <laughs> me tell you about this. Let me, let me share this, Victor. So I don't think we've talked about this before. I've talked about it on the podcast before. My dad bought a car, and it, it came up in conversation the other day. Uh, my dad bought a car from this place called Motorpoint in the UK, right? It's a big... A car supermarket would be the way I'd describe it. And the cars, are they've all got like a 50 miles on, 100 miles on. They're all basically brand new cars that the dealerships couldn't shift from the forecourt. So I assume they sell them cheap and most point buys them. So my dad bought a car from there. I went with him uh, because he wanted backup in case it was going to be sold to. And, um, you know, my dad's owned small businesses. He's not soft kind of thing. But he felt like he wanted me to come with him in, in case I, we were going to have to duel with a salesperson to get a deal done, right? Walked in the door. Guy came over, he goes, right, I'm not a salesperson. There's no commissions. I get a bonus if you're happy at the end of this, whether you buy or not. I was like, okay, that's good. And he's like, right, have a wander around, right? Have a wander around. And if there's any cars you like, come and let me know and I'll give you the keys and I can either stand with you and answer questions or I can give you the keys and um, you can't drive it without me being in the car, clearly. But you can get in and, and, and have a look around and, and see what's up. So we got the now, before keys. You go any further, before sure. you go any further, sure. you know, I, I, I'm listening to you say this, right? Tell the story. I think it's great. And people are listening to this. And at this moment, you, you have to ask yourself, do I like this? Do I like this approach? And my immediate reaction, I could be wrong. I don't know where this story is going, which is yeah. why I stopped you. I'm going, I kind of like this. Mm -hmm. I kind of like this. So you'll, you'll see where it goes. A bit, right? So, so we go get keys to this, um, the VW and this Ford, like SUVs, and we're going through them and, the price is on there and the guys at the price is the price. There's no negotiations either way. That's what it is. So it's, it's a fair price. It's not unreasonable. And it's, you know, it is what it is. And the VW is slightly more expensive and it's less spec and the Ford is slightly cheaper, but it's better spec. And we, he comes back over, um, and we give him the keys and he's like, well, can we go and test drive? He's like, yeah, Just go around the, go around the, uh, you know, around the motorway where the, the place is and, and give it a test drive, come back. And the guy goes, what, what do you think? And dad goes, right, I'll, I'll buy the Ford. And that was it. That, that was literally the, the whole conversation, the whole transaction. But why, why I'm telling you this tale, Victor, is my dad has told so many people about this place that all these mates, I'm not, I'm, I'm not exaggerating here, right? Five, six, seven of his mates have bought cars from there over the past couple of years as well. My dad now, as one happy customer, has generated hun literally hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of revenue for this organization. Isn't that amazing? It's, but isn't, isn't that, Will, if you, that's like a, like, like a microcosm of what we want. Mm -hmm. Just be upfront. You know, I don't get commissions. Whether you buy or not, you know, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just here to help you make a buying decision. Yep. If you need clarification yep. or confirmation, I'm here for you. 
If you want me to stand next to you and hold your hand, I'll do that. If you want me to get away, I'll do that too. I'm like, it's exactly what I want. Yep. And and as soon as I went through that conversation, that engagement, that buying cycle or you know sales cycle, however they want to describe it, I was like, this is it. This is other than a few niche areas. So for example, medical devices, I had to go in, I had to do training and it was a similar kind of thing, but this is your large account based sales. And so I I wouldn't, I had to put a lot more work in than what this guy had to do to sell a car to close his account. And so I should be compensated appropriately for that. But other than that, with the ability that brands have to to market and get information in front of us, I, you know, I think we're on the same wavelength there. Of, that's probably where all this is leading, right? Here's a question. Is that guy really a salesperson? No, I don't think he is. See, I would argue he is. I would argue he is. Tell me why you don't think he is. So I don't think you can split sales and generating, uh, directly generating revenue, imp- using your influence to generate revenue. He was there to uh, essentially, in my opinion, do customer experience and make the the last part of the buying journey as pleasant as possible. There was no uh, follow-up. There was no, all the things that we uh, tie into sales, there was very little of any of that. And as I said, he was just happy to happy to be there. And, and it, was, it was probably job was a lot less stressful than any sales job. So that probably ties into it as well. So what if, uh, for example, let's say you go in there and you don't know his car. You don't know cars as much. You and your father don't know cars as much. And you have two choices, maybe three. And you're just wrapped up in a Gordian knot here. You, don't, you can't decide. You then turn to that person and say, hey, help me out. So here we go, Victor. This is the, this, I love this, right? I don't know if he would be all that helpful because oh. he's got no... Then, then, your, then your answer is correct then. Then your yeah. answer is correct. So he might I be able to agree. give you the information, but sometimes, and, and I think, tell me if I'm right in saying this, I think sometimes in sales, you have to have just so much, you have to know your product, your service, your industry. You've got to know it so well that you're capable of saying that is the correct decision right there. In my opinion, you should be doing this. I don't think that guy was capable of doing that. I think he was too, um, you know, I think he was capable of doing that, but he wasn't trained to do that. And I think that's perhaps the difference between how I experience sales and how I sell. You know, I use my industry knowledge to to benefit people, to add insights, to share value. But this guy was, this guy could have been replaced by a screen rolling around with a, a bag of keys and, <laughs> you know, with the stats of the car. I, I always say, you know, and the only time I think he should be called a salesperson is that if you asked him a question and he was able to provide one of two things, confirmation based on what you're asking, yes, that is correct, or clarification, let me help you understand this. And if, if none of that's happening, then you are absolutely <laughs> right. That person is not a salesperson. So interesting. So, hey, Will, did you know there's a new trend <laughs> oh, that for an opening? <laughs> And that was that was a called, sick transition, Victor, right there. <laughs> Did you know there's something now called drum roll, please? VP of pipeline. I saw this in uh, this is a Forbes article, Forbes.com. And I saw this and I go, VP of pipeline, a key role for aligning sales and marketing. And the VP of pipeline definition here reports to both the chief marketing officer and the chief revenue officer or the CEO, and is responsible for building the pipeline and guiding the pipeline development strategy. They oversee the sales development representatives and demand generation, field marketing, sales enablement teams, as well as account-based programs. They essentially find the unifying thread. There it is, Will, the unifying thread in all these departments. Three things. The VP of pipeline will evaluate marketing sales performance in a weekly meeting. The VP of pipeline will drive sales content. The VP of pipeline will lead the strategy to test different approaches. Uh, this is a unicorn. I want to call this a unicorn. <laughs> you you find me somebody who can do all that and just pay that person the money. What do you think of this? Well, so tell me if this is uh, this is happens usually in in big corporations because I I've never seen this before and it might be me being ignorant, right? But a corporation typically has CSO, uh, CEO, president, whoever at the top going down to over the C-suite, then going down to VPs. Is it usual for someone to report to two people above them? Because if that's the case, then surely this is inverted and that person's priorities are never going to be straight. 
this is a mess. <laughs> this right here, if anybody knew business and understood organizations, mm -hmm. they would go, there is no way that is going to work. I, at one time, little personal history, was selling technology telecom, telecom products. We had six different business units, which means I had six different people who paid for my whole teams and my salary. I had six different bosses. And everybody, everyone would call every other week to say, why aren't you pushing my stuff? Why aren't you pushing my stuff? And I, I had to be like a diplomat. And so imagine reporting to the CMO and maybe the CEO or the, the, the CSO, and you got to report to these folks, both with different motivations. Yep. Marketing one side, sales the other side. And you're supposed to be the unifying thread in all departments. Oh, I didn't know what to think of this one. I just kind of, you know. I'm, I'm glad you're on the same wavelength as me on this because I looked at it and I was like, this is interesting. The, the, idea, the concept of someone whose job it is to manage pipeline across the company is not an unreasonable thing. If the company is big enough and the revenue is big enough to justify it, right? That I don't think that is unreasonable because obviously it's, it's incredibly complex. It's the CEO's job to manage the pipeline. Can we just <laughs> say that? It's the CEO's job to manage the pipeline across all divisions. So how do we Which fix is. this? Uh, we, we've got a magic wand, Victor. How do we fix this divide between sales and marketing? We just spent 20 minutes banging on about the fact that they're, they're so aligned right now that essentially sales is finishing up a lot of marketing work and getting the deal done. How do we fix the problem? I, I think you, I would collapse them both under, uh, I don't know what the new title should be, but, and I like, the, I like chief revenue officer. Yep. I kind of like that title, but it doesn't have enough you know, uh, marketing in it. So I don't know, as a chief marketing revenue officer, you know, or chief marketing sales officer, chief marketing officer, you know. But why doesn't it have enough marketing in it? Because this is something that I don't get. Is is this because, and we, we, maybe we should have a conversation with a CMO who can put us in our place, but is it because we think marketing is all fancy pants, nonsense branding and making pretty images, and we think <laughs> sales do the actual work, that we want to we wanna balance out the two? Or should it be a CRO who then just says, your job is to generate leads, but get all the rest of it. Your job is to close them. Well, I'm not going to argue with you on the title. I think we both agree that it should be collapsed under sales and marketing should have one overlord, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and that overlord should say, look, I need you to make sure that the customer journey and preference formation and all those beautiful things happen. Sales, I need you to close those marketing qualified leads type of thing. And it'll drop to the bottom line. I think the VP of pipeline is... It's a horrible job for a person who's going to be caught between, you know, in the crossfire and the amount of blame and, you know, displacement of who's to blame for what is going to be incredible. That's, 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 that's a position for failure. I wouldn't I was going to say, is that, is that maybe the point of it? That it is someone to dump a load of stuff <laughs> that we don't understand onto and hopefully they can make it happen. Yeah. Or, or we say, we well, need a scapegoat. Every month, the, the chief marketing officer got together with chief sales officer and said, look, here's the deal. So they don't blame you or me. <laughs> Why don't we just create a new position called the VP of Pipeline? And we'll just blame that person. I feel like, not in the same vein as this, but on a similar kind of pathway, I feel like sales enablement and all these titles of those individuals that are coming out are difficult jobs as well because what you're doing, you're managing technology, you're creating content, you're making sure that everyone's on board. You're doing all these different jobs, but there's no real, there's no box to tick or there's too many boxes to tick, right? that you can just be blamed for a lot of the stuff. Another title I heard that I liked was uh, uh, Chief Sales Operations. You know, and I love that because operations now includes a lot. It has a bigger umbrella because if I view sales as an operation, then it has many moving pieces. Mm -hmm. And so I love that. I love that title. And there, because to your point, for example, just the engagement technology that's out there, this is not something you say, hey, let me just jump on this and learn this real quick. No, you have to immerse yourself in there and not you know, kill yourself after a month of trying to do this stuff. And so I think the chief sales operation role might be something to look at in the future, just collapse those under and look at it, just like we look at manufacturing and operations as many moving pieces. Why can't we do that with this? You know, Content is the raw material. Yep. The machinery could be salespeople, right? The promotional piece, well, that's just the wrapping around the actual packaging. I agree. Well, that, that's how I try and look at sales and marketing as a as a process, right? Is it? Do you think that's not common? Do you think that the split between marketing and sales in these big, big organizations 
makes this idea that I have in my head, how I visualize it as a as a conveyor belt, just not work at all. Yeah, I, I like your approach because I think that's the new where we're at today. Before you can actually do a divide, but I think marketing has become so intertwined with sales right now, you wouldn't even know where to cut one off to start the other one. Mm -hmm. Or before you could. And that's why I think your continuous flow process makes more sense. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, well, Victor, we're going to get into the next topic now. Uh, you see, in the intro, you see more excited about this topic than any of the others. Okay. This one got me jacked yeah. up. This one got me jacked up. <laughs> Do, Victor, tattoos affect your career? Why don't you go ahead and read that one? I want you to read that one. So by Jessica Hartogs, editor over at LinkedIn News, and we'll link all of these um, posts and articles over in the show notes as well for this episode. She says, a kindergarten teacher in France says his heavily tattooed face and black inked eyes may have cost him his job. I don't think may, very likely cost him his job. After <laughs> parents complained that he frightened the child. Um, I don't know why the child is named there. That's uh, not appropriate. Who now teaches... Oh, no, that's the, that's the guy, Sylvian, who now teaches children six and up, says that after initial shock, when they see him for the first time, his pupils see past their appearance. Which is... Fine, because kids don't care about this kind of stuff, right? But I guess right. the real question is, does a parent's opinion on you or does the customer's opinion on you uh, having face tattoos matter more than the employer's opinion on you having tattoos? Yeah, this was interesting because uh, this one, I actually saw the picture of the guy. He was, it was a little scary. You know, you've seen people who've tattooed their face, especially when they tattoo, I don't know, what do you call it when you tattoo, you, you black ink your eyes. And he did kind of have, you know, uh, an intimidating look, but I don't know. Should we expose kids to this stuff early on? See, I mean, there's just so many ways you can look at this. Like if I'm a parent and these kids are only a six, I don't want them to see this and be influenced by them, especially if I think, because that's where this, this whole argument goes, does having a tattoo impact your ability to move up or be successful if you're an entrepreneur? Well, look, there's, there's precedents for this, right? Of if we start at the, the very bottom, if you wear socks and sandals to a business meeting with a bunch of bankers, they're not going to take you seriously. And so you're not going to get a deal done. Tattoos on your face are just the far end of this scale, right? And so people's opinions, uh, prejudices, biases, they do matter, even if they will admit that they do. How people are wired culturally, in some places of the world, this might not be a big deal. Some places it might be, it might be the color of your skin. It could be anything, right? All these things do subconsciously affect people and their opinions of you. So, as I said, I I think Victor, this comes down to if a customer doesn't care, then the employee sh the employer should not care either. I agree. I, you know, tattoos have you we all know this have become more acceptable. You know, 10, 15 years ago, if you had a tattoo, you were probably a biker. That was the stereotype, right? And then now you see tattoos everywhere. Uh, I think it's interesting how you know since I'm just a tad older than you, I've seen this generational mind shift of where, you know, only people who are in the armed services and bikers wore tattoos. And now it's become, personally, I think it's gone too far to the other side, if you know what I mean, like too many tattoos. Uh, and I think anything from the collarbone up should be avoided personally, like do all the tattoos you want, but if you need to cover it up to look business-like, you know, I got, I got a friend, his name is Ken, and I didn't realize he was tattooed up. And I've known this guy for a few years. Mm -hmm. And then he posted this poster on, on this picture on, on Instagram where he had just completed these huge tattoos front and back. And this was just a new tattoo he was adding. And I'm like, dude, I never noticed you had it. He goes, no, no. He says, it's almost like the Yakuza way. You know, mm -hmm. you keep, you yeah. only go up to the wrist, to the collarbone, and nobody knows you have one. And I think there's something to be said for that. But there's nothing wrong. Some of them actually look pretty cool. So I don't have an opinion on them. I don't have a tattoo. But the question is, <laughs> does Will Barrett have a tattoo? The answer is no, but I do want one. Um, I've just been too... It, every year or so, it, it becomes up. Uh, every year, January, uh, December time, I do my, my goals for the year and all that kind of stuff. And... <laughs> Tattoo is setup on that was great. You know, the, the, the tattoo, tattoo isn't necessarily a a goal for the year. But when I'm thinking about uh, things that have gone right, things that have gone um, not so good, and then you you go to five, ten years either way, and you go in all Tony Robbins on things and really contemplating things, which I really like to do uh, for at least a week or so in in December and, and to get my head straight and to be strategized for the next year, the next twelve months. I always come up with loads of really good ideas for tattoos. 
the problem is victor i always um put it off for you know at least a month i think that's like a sensible thing to do right or if you're gonna make a a massive ridiculous stupid purchase you should put it off for a month or two and feel, see how you feel after that fact after i come back after a month or two uh, january february i feel like the idea that i had was stupid and i definitely shouldn't have done it and i would have regretted it so this is the problem i do want a tattoo in answer to your question well the answer to your question i don't have any tattoos um but i would have tattoos all over me if i could get away with it i, I feel like i like the element of of art i don't feel like i am uh, I would be like ruining my body or anything like that. I think they're really cool. If they're done if they're done right and they're meaningful, I think you can tell a story through a tattoo or a series of tattoos. And um, I think not everyone goes down that route. There's plenty of Hello Kitty tattoos that are, you know, just stupid drunken mistakes. But I think they can be quite cool. But going back to what you're saying, I would never get a tattoo below kind of a polo shirt, sleeve or, you know, collar, uh, bone. Um, I, I feel like it's important that you could cover it up because I want to make money, right? And I don't want to give someone the opportunity to say no to me because of a stupid tattoo. Yeah, I, and I think also, you know, there's also you know, something called age appropriateness of your tattoo. You know, it's funny when you're younger, you know, some of your tattoos in somewhat different areas uh, are somewhat, you know, they kind of excuse them. But as you get older, much, much older, you know, they just don't look as attractive anymore. It's not as hip, you know, so that's something to consider down the road. But I don't think they should impact people getting hired. Uh, I don't think it, in this case, I think it's a, this one, this one's a toss up because I saw the picture and I would, I could understand the parents like hesitation for kids to be exposed to this type of, uh, I guess, culture that early without really understanding what they were actually looking at. So well, I don't let, know. Let me ask you this then, Victor, this will be a great way to wrap this up, right? You have got a seven-year-old kid and they go to the school. And this teacher is world renowned, world class. You meet him, he's incredible, he's so caring, and he's doing a fantastic job. And you see your kid grow week on week as, as they're in there. But they've got tattoos all over the face, massive nose rings, I don't know, whatever kind of thing you want to do to your body. You want to like punkify yourself. Mm -hmm. They've got a pink mohawk, and they were, I don't know, bell bottom jeans and a t shirt that's too tight. Something weird. I don't know. <laughs> would you would you be complaining or would you be like fine the, the the teacher's exceptional at the job they've got the skill set i need and so i can look past all the rest of it I, I i personally think i would be okay with it there'd be some discussions with the child like hey look down the road if you want to wear tattoos you want to do any of this get stuff. tattoo i'm gonna just slap you, you over know, the head and we'll, I, have, we'll have issues no, no, i said you know at, at the age of let's say 18 whatever it is you want to do whatever you want do you do it you know just make sure you get this done uh so it'll be their choice but anyway that's enough. Tattoos and sales. By the way, here's a question that people should post online. I think this would be interesting if they can answer this question. If you were to suggest a tattoo for Will, what would that tattoo be? We'd like to hear your opinions on this. Do you know what? If if the audience wasn't big enough that they could rally together and and make it happen, I would say like so many thousand subscribers or so many likes or something, but I'm not even going to go there just in case. So how about, about 5,000? 5, 5,000 people say, Will should get a tattoo. <laughs> no, because the audience, the, the audience now knows enough people that they could get the mates involved and that could happen in an instant. What's your, what's your number, Will? Is it, is it 10,000, no. 20,000? Is it 100,000? I, I, we're not doing this. If we were hypothetically to do this, I'd, <laughs> I'd, get, I'd, I'd get people to put their money where their mouth is and it would have to be a money amount raised for charity. I would get something appropriate tattooed on me okay. all right all right all right we'll leave it at that and then i'll blame you and i'll send you all the psychiatry bills and uh <laughs> the ptsd trauma medication bills and all that kind of stuff after the fact victor that's funny, that's funny. All good right. man well, we should, should we move on to some tech sales tech updates because uh time's getting on here yep okay okay so first one and the power move in brackets here in the dock forrester names outreach a sales enablement leader uh, outreach was given the highest possible scores in 11 criteria on the Forrester wave. Yeah. First off, Victor, let me ask you this. Does any of this <laughs> really matter to consumers or is this an ego stroke for a company? I, I, well, I think, you know, when, when a Forrester, you know, puts you on their matrix and puts you as, as a leader, you know, I think this is important for a company like Outreach, who's trying, trying to be with people like, you know, like a sales loft. And then I, I said, followed up by the others. And it lets other companies know that there's a new player in the market and they've been validated. So I, I, I see it as validation. 
The company's been growing, it's been moving, and guess what? Their blueprint for the future, what they're doing with their technology is worth looking at. I agree. I, th the reason I said that is that I get put on top lists of nonsense all of the time. The people are just trying to get you to share the posts that they're putting you on. I'm sure you're on all these top lists for your YouTube channel content as well. And so there's clearly a massive differentiation there between blah, 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 blog post, which I'm happy to be on. Fine, it's a link to the website and Forrester or Gartner, right? Yeah, I, I, the thing is, I see these though. If you look at the the, the, the graph, um, well, here, let me take a step back. Uh, I was reading a study and I can't remember where it was, but it, it had, you know, like five years ago, there were 700 MarTech companies, marketing technology companies. Now today, they're like, I don't know, like 7,000 something, something, right? So out of 7,000, 10 are in the top. You know, that's really, you've been selected. That's not you're you're the you know you're the top 100 and nobody actually because as a lot of these things you're talking about well I you know I've been part of those you get you know nominated for you know best podcast the top 40 podcast and I'm going well how did you decide that yeah and then you you because you try to rationalize I see people who don't even have any traffic or get any downloads are in that top 40 which it loses credibility I think companies like you know like Forrester Gartner and the others you know they really go through this stuff and I think they really validate. And by the way, remember what they're really selling. They're really selling their studies and their reports to these companies and their consulting business. So they need to know their stuff. So that's why I think this is big. They've got skin in the game then, right? Because if they start throwing out nonsense announcements, then people aren't going to be buying the reports. Is that about right? That is correct. So I, I think it's really fascinating. It's just interesting to see what's happening with technology and <clears throat> how enablement and engagement are really taking over. Let me ask you this. This is a side um, question to this because I can see that Zant there, X A N T dot com. So I've got no affiliation with these guys. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot, Victor. Which is a because they they've converted from insideselling dot com to Zant dot com. Which was the better domain and branding? For these, oh, I don't know. Um, are you are you talking about between which ones? So Zant used to be insideselling com, and they've completely rebranded. I don't know what happened, organizational issues, whatever. I, I didn't know that, Will. Yep. I didn't know yep. that. I did not know that. You just told me something I didn't know. So I think insideselling.com is an incredible domain if you're providing services for people doing inside selling. I can't believe that the chain that I'll reach out to them, actually. I'll put it in the show notes, but there must be a story behind it. But I, when I saw the news that they'd changed from that brand to Xant, Xant's a great domain name as well, xant.com. Yeah, uh, if you if you don't have an opinion, that's fine. I, no, I don't have an opinion, but I can only guess that they're probably trying to expand their portfolio and break the mold of what they used to be, like anything else. I think they're trying to get away from the inside sales, and maybe they're looking at, you know, uh, when you look at, for example, we talk about sales engagement or sales enablement is to enable salespeople. The sales engagement platforms are really to help marketing through the customer journey. So maybe they want to play in both domains, and they need to kind of change their name. X is the X factor, I guess, in Zant. That It'd be interesting to see how they come up with the name. I, that's my guess. That's that's why I asked you the question because I didn't even think of that. But yeah, you're right. If you're trying to expand the market and your name's tying you into one specific part of it, and it's a um, you know it's a venture backed company, so they've got to they've got to IPO, right? They've got to get that money back out at some point. That makes total sense. Yeah. Good. Well, Victor, what's, what have we got next? Well, let me see. I have. I'm going to jump. Well, talk to me about saleshood. Let's let's hit that technology piece again. So Saleshood, they've just released, I'll link this in the, the, in the docs, in the, in the notes as well, a new tool for a virtual sales kickoff meeting. And the reason I wanted to ask you about this, Victor, was twofold. One, do we need kickoff meetings every year, every quarter as a, as a sales team to be effective? And I'll tell you about my experience with them in a second. And two, can they be done virtually? Is that even a, a worthwhile effort in time? So I'll, I'll go based on my experience. So technology company, we had a sales kickoff meeting, but there was a purpose. It wasn't so much for the salespeople to go rah, rah, you're the best, you're the greatest, you can do it, let's make it happen again. It was all about, there were a lot of new products being rolled out. And we as salespeople got to be in a room, sometimes three, 400 salespeople with the product manager and the marketing person who told us what this product was going to do and why they developed it and how we should sell it. So that's what a kickoff meeting was for. And then it turned into this, oh, by the way, let's, let's hire a speaker. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's create that camaraderie. But, but I think to me, the essence of a kickoff meeting has been lost in the rah-rah. 
Yep. We should get yep. back to, we're launching new products. We need to train you on them. Let's position ourselves for success next year, blah, blah, blah. So if that's the context, then yes, we need those. But will virtual be just as effective as being there face to face? And we'll just have to say yes for now. It'll have to be, it'll have to do as, as good of a job. But I think there was always something about sitting down with the product manager, touching the product physically, if you sold a product that really engaged you with the product. I'll, I'll, I've never had really good experiences with sales kickoff meetings. I found that we've never done product training or anything like that. It's always been perhaps a company overview update. I always thought it could be something that could be done in a real slick video that you spend 20 minutes watching rather than two days out of the calendar. And I would have to go from the beautiful north of England down to the the, the, the south of England where all the southerners live, right? I'd have to go down there and, and spend time with them. And the last one I had, I, I'll tell you about this experience, Victor. <laughs> I hope you don't have any southern fans here, you know. You no, know the, there's, the, I think, it's pro I, I assume there's a similar kind of um, balance here between the east coast and west coast of America where there's anywhere. We don't in, care about the west. Coast. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> anywhere above Birmingham in the UK, the southerners just think are like inbred um, farmers. That's basically the the uh, stereotype of us lot. But with that said, the last kickoff meeting I went to, Victor, I sat down and I felt a rumble in my phone. I'm like, oh, freaking hell, what's this going on? So I ignored it, right? No big deal. We're at a kickoff meeting. I can call the customer back in the break. Who cares? Not a big deal. Get another buzz. Not a big deal. Next thing, my sales manager is um, texting me. And I can see him texting me and he's looking at me across the room and he's telling me he's doing the arrow, right? The, the finger pointing, like, get outside now. We, we got a chat about something. So I'm like, oh, freaking hell. So I had a surgeon. Bear in mind that the sales team are there, the sales management team are there, the sales leadership team are there, the CEO of the company is there. He, he was actually on stage speaking at the time. So I look like a right mug now being dragged out of the, the, converse, the, the meeting by my sales manager in front of the CEO. And you can tell, you know, He's, he's locked eyes on me. He he knows that I've done something, caused something, something's up. He's made a mental note to, whilst we're all in the same room, he'll catch me later on and just, you know, see how things are going. So I'm like, frigging hell. Um, and I had a surgeon who needed something, right? No big deal. He called me. I didn't answer. So then he called the sales manager. He didn't answer. Called the director of sales. Didn't answer. And then had left a voicemail on the CEO's um, uh, phone, which the secretary picked up and then pinged the message back down beneath all this and the surgeon by this point by the time we all got to the room and called him back we just called him on a group dial right he was going mental and so i got absolute rollicking for something that wasn't my fault because we were dragged out of the sales conversation and that's my opinion on kickoff meetings victor that from the sales perspective i've never got anything out of them and i got a complete rollicking out the last one i went to so there we go by the way is that word rollicking um it's a Rollic polite way of saying bollocking yeah, bollocking, rollicking. Okay. The, so ours were planned, I think, a little better. We just have probably had better management than you did because we were given time to make phone calls. <laughs> we were given time to make phone calls. So we would do like an hour run, hour and a half, and then boom, phone call time. You know, so you get like an hour to make phone calls, catch up and make some sales. So it really depends how it's done. But I think if it's just to get the team fired up, I say no, not worth it. If it is to really update the team on what's going on with the company, new products, new strategies for selling, I'm all for that. Got it. That makes total sense. Okay, Victor, tell us about this DocuSign uh, agreement with a, a new AI solution. You know, this this to me was just a sign of things to come. And I've already seen some of this in, let's say, the legal business, right? Where uh, the, the AI, the machine learning can actually find case law studies or case laws rather when you need to actually defend something or, you know, whatever, prosecute somebody. And so now to see DocuSign adopt some of this technology so that basically, and now this was, uh, by the way, I got this from a website called salestechstar.com. Again, we'll put the link in the description. And what was interesting is that in this article, it talked about how it could actually find gotcha lines, you know, that you might want to highlight and it actually re, you know, rejigger, reconfigure, rewrite in order to get not caught in, in a certain situation. Also, it'll allow you to negotiate much faster and quicker if you can go through the contract quicker. Uh, companies I've worked with in the past, I mean, you give them a contract and it was like, you know, you throw it into the vortex <laughs> and maybe, you know, you know, 20 days later, you'll get something out of legal. Yeah. So I think this is gonna accelerate the process. But what I love about this is it puts the power of AI in this context into the hands of the average consumer. 
how far do you think that is going to go? And I don't want to, I don't want this to be a doom and gloomy, like salespeople are now redundant, but from the perspective of, can we get to the point where AI goes, well, you have put this on the contract with the price. Well, we'll drop this little bit of value so that you get there. Well, we'll, we'll increase the value so it's going to do this. And you plug your AI of your company, enterprise company, into the AI of another enterprise company. And they go, we've got a solution here. We can set all this up. All the software is being installed right now. You've got your demos. And AI can do a lot of this, you know, as you said, the, the litigation, the negotiation, the back and forth that salespeople often have to put up with. Can it do a lot of this for us? I mean, you're you're looking for like a like an AI handshake, right? <laughs> let the let the AIs go at it and figure it out. Uh, I think we're a ways away from that because I think what has to happen, and this is context based. Every company is going to have different, I guess, rules to work with different. You know, again, from the device industry, you had different contracts set up with different people in different territory for different product lines. The same thing will happen here. What I think this is highlighting is that the contract department now has a tool to expedite move to the process, a contract much faster. That's as far as I want to go with, you know, touting this. That's it. That's all I'm saying. And it'll highlight where the pitfalls might be so you can resolve them quicker and get that contract back to the salesperson so you can close that deal, make that commission and go out to dinner with the spouse. So let me ask you this then from a different perspective. So I'm company A, I am doing a deal with company B and company C is in this example, DocuSign who have the, the technology right. Who is to blame if five years down the line, things break down, we look through the contract and we realize that they've been screwing us over this one thing and we can't get out of the contract and everything's a mess. Is it our fault? Is it good on the company who negotiated this into the contract or do we get to blame that third party? Well, I still believe in the man and machine thing here. In other words, this is going to push it up to the point where somebody still has to put eyeballs on it. Like a human being has to put eyeballs on it because I don't think the AI can be that smart. It doesn't have the context to make certain decisions. So I think uh, it's a man machine or woman machine type of situation. Because the reason I ask is this happened in medicine right now. It happened a few years ago and it's happened again in the past few months that a doctor, a radiologist had missed a, a scan, a cancer on a scan. AI had found it and then the doctor had confirmed that he'd missed it and it was found on there. And this has happened twice now that a life or two lives have been saved because of AI. Yet, clearly, there's massive pushback from all doctors and you know, the medical community to rely on AI for this kind of thing. Everyone wants to have uh, you know, a doctor have the final say when you know, we might be at a point in the not too distant future where AI, especially when it's pattern recognition and, and machine learning to uncover things on like scans and the same with these kind of documents, they could probably do it yeah, way better I, I, than I a human. That, but it, doesn't that, I mean, why would the doctors complain? I've seen this, by the way, where they, you know, the doctors, there's a certain error rate that they have, but the machine learning is able to pick it up, right? Their pattern recognition, as you said. And so I think it's interesting. Again, I still think there's this man machine thing that we have to, you know, if I didn't catch it, run it through the machine just in case. Why can't we just use the machine as a backup? Just run it through the machine just in case. Or run it through an AI DocuSign. Run it through the DocuSign AI. Let's see what it says. Let's see what it highlights. And let's go from there. Sure. That makes sense. I'm, I'm trying to get, I think I'm trying to get a reaction out of you, Victor. You, you're being you're very- You're not going to get one. I know, what you're trying, <laughs> I know what you're trying to do, Will. You, I know what you're trying to do. It's like, you know, but I'm not going to give it to you. I, you know, is, in other words, are two machines going to talk to each other and make that's, a deal? That's what, I, that's what I want. I want to be sat yeah, on a beach somewhere want, while my business does business with another business and I'm just, and me and you having margaritas. They get into this echo chamber yeah. loop and next thing you know, it's Armageddon. We have, what's the, uh, what's the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger? Uh, remember the movie, The Terminator? What was it? Skynet? Then the mm -hmm. Skynet kicks in and, and, and bombs are flying because <laughs> we couldn't negotiate a contract on devi medical devices. It just accelerates, it, you know. Okay, well, that, that probably gives us some perspective there. Well, let's wrap up the show with uh, two segments, Victor. First off, we had a question from Jermaine. He works over at Salesforce. I've not said your surname. I assume that is the appropriate way to go about this so you don't get called out for it. But Jermaine asks, hey, Will, Victor, I love the new show format. My question is, how do I launch my own show covering industry news? What are the first steps? Thanks. So Jermaine, thank you for the question, mate. And Victor, I'll let you have a go at this first, mate. What does Jermaine need to do to start his own show, I guess, in the CRM industry to, to build his own personal brand? So I, I think in the if you're going to start, you know, I, I would start gentle. Like I, I would try to do podcasts first. 
because video can be intimidating right off the bat, right? And so maybe cut your teeth on the podcast, which is simply a microphone, a computer, and your wonderful brain with great knowledge, right? That little combination. And then, you know, evolve to the next stage where you feel like you can, you know, do an actual video podcast and then evolve to the next level, which is bring in guests and so forth. So I would take the gradual steps because I think what typically happens is just like you and I are discovery, right? You realize there's work and effort required in doing this and you have to make time for it. And so I think that also has to be taken into consideration. Do you really, really, really want to do this? Because I don't think there's anything worse from someone looking at you and your personal brand of you start a project, you do it for two months, and then it's dormant for three years. I think that looks maybe even worse than just uh, not doing anything, right? And just staying in in your lane. But with that, Victor, I did exactly what you just said. I was was smiling when you said it. If you look at the YouTube channel, if you put it in reverse chronological order, you don't see my face on uh, any of the, the content. It's always audio and then there's a little bit of the guest and none of my face because i was scared crapless of of being on video when i first started with all of this and it was only like was it three years ago four years ago that i i just i was nervous of being on video i thought i looked stupid on video i probably still look quite daft on video right now but um i don't know whether it was an ego thing i don't know whether it was just um you know not being able to get out of my comfort zone i don't know what it was but I look back at your YouTube channel, plus TV show, plus everything else that you've done speaking on stage. Did you have to get through that moment of of being on video or being recorded and kind of like you know get on with it as well? I think yeah. I think the first step was getting over yourself because we you know as, as human beings we always see our imperfections right and we magnify them in our head more than other people. And you know so I got over that years ago when I started recording my first video. So. And when uh, was like, that? I did post, was that like seven, eight years uh, ago? Ninety-five. Wow. And that's uh, so. If you go to if you go online, you want to have you want to have a laugh. Uh, if you go online, you type in Victor Antonio first Toastmaster speech. I was a little thinner, and I had beautiful locks in my, on my head, just wow. beautiful locks. And I remember looking at. Um, Remember, I remember looking at my first video and I'm like, oh my God, I look horrible, this and that. But I just started doing it. And then you get over my first video, even on on YouTube, I I look back and I go, oh, that's horrible. But I go, just get over yourself. So, you know, for Jermaine, get over yourself, Jermaine. Uh, You're good looking. I don't even know who you are. Uh, Even if you have a defect, it's probably, you know, endearing, right, to somebody. So it it's really the content. I think we can both agree on that, Will, that it's content really drives, you know, people to want to listen or watch you, you know, so you can have a, you know, a patch over your eye and just deliver great content. People are going to love you, man. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Jermaine's fully tattooed up and has uh, inked eyes and all that stuff as well. Deliver the, just like you said, but if they're smart, they deliver the content and they teach well, Hey, why not? I'll, I'll, I'll listen to you, Jermaine. I'll watch you. So you mentioned Toastmasters. There. Is there anything else that we should be doing to, uh, if, if ego is one problem, actually being good is another problem on stage, on camera, right? There's Toastmasters. What else can we do to get better on, on camera other than just continuing I think doing it for years? To, well, I have a friend. I won't mention his name. And man, he's just struggling with video. He keeps changing his set. He keeps changing this. He keeps changing that. All this is procrastination to not get on the actual video camera. And I'm like, dude, just record something already. And I try to get to the psychology of what it is. First of all, his self-image, he has a problem with that. That's the big one. Uh, the second thing is uh, you've got to know your content fluidly because if you have to think about everything you have to say, then it becomes very difficult. So for Jermaine, I would start with in an industry market that I kind of knew already, and I can just build on that knowledge. In other words, don't talk above your pay grade. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you've never done something, you've never been in something, don't, don't talk about it. It's just not, not a good thing. And so I think getting comfortable with the content and knowing you can do it. But I think you and I, we're like avid readers slash studiers, watchers, listeners of content because we want to up our game all the time and really understand what's going out there. So I think that I think if you had that and you got over your self-image, then getting on camera is not a big deal. Have you read the book um, Psycho-Cybernetics? Yes, Maxwell Maltz. Yep. So I found that really helpful in getting over not necessarily getting over my own ego but becoming more uh, accustomed to seeing myself on camera and the stories that i tell myself about myself changing those stories up that you're fine on camera (laughs) 
who cares? No, nobody really notices anyway. People are just kind of going back and forth and tuning in and out. It's not the end of the world. No one's thinking about nobody you after really the fact, right? No. I, the thing is, we, you know, there, look, how many memories do you have in your head of something that happened that you did when you were young? It was just stupid, mm -hmm. right? Find that moment in your head right now. And I bet you, if you tell a friend, ask your friend who was there with you 10, 15 years later, hey, do you remember that? He goes, no, why? Yeah, you know, they don't remember. You remember you you magnified in your head sometimes. Great book, by the way, Psycho Cybernetics, Maxwell Maltz. Yep. Have you read the so there's the new Psycho Cybernetics? Have you read the original one as well? I read the original one. I didn't know there was a new one. So the the new one, just in case anyone Google's this or buys it on Amazon, the original one is better, in my opinion, than the new one. It kind of got things dumbed down in the uh, in the new one. I'll leave that in the show notes of this episode as well. Okay, with that then, let's wrap up. For this week in sales, Victor, what is your big takeaway for the week? Well, that sales enablement is the new mark, the new smart kidding, right? I think this whole, I used to think these words were just play words, sales enablement, sales engagement, but I believe both of them now play a role, uh, enablement specifically, uh, uh, engagement rather in marketing and enablement more in sales. The VP of pipeline is an interesting concept that brings sales and marketing together, but I think they're doomed for failure unless you find a unicorn that can actually, what is it, what they call it? To manage the thread that winds through all of these, like an Ariadne's thread. Uh, the pandemic pivoting is real, which means, look, let's do virtual, but let's figure out how to do it the right way. And to your point, well, do we need to do these kickoff meetings? That's, that's a good topic. And I'll probably never, ever get a tattoo, Will. There we go. Here's a test of my sales skills. Can I influence Victor to get a tattoo over the next few quarters of, of putting this show together? <laughs> that's the that's the goal of all of this. You're going to end up like, who's got cool tattoos? Conor McGregor, he's got cool tattoos, a big chimp on his chest wearing a crown. Yeah. I feel like you could pull that off, Victor. I don't know if I could pull that off. I don't think my wife would allow that. I'd have to get approval from the boss, man. So I think that's going to be a no-go right there. <laughs> Good, man. Well, my takeaway from the week is I did kind of what we were talking about then with, with answering Jermaine's question is you should worry about what you can control and you should not worry about what you can't. And you can look into that as, as deeply or as lightly as you need to. But I find this is a really good, um, when I'm, if I ever do feel stressed, if I ever feel like uh, things are spiraling out of control, which is very rare, but business-wise, if things are not going my way, that's what I come back to every single time. What can I do today to move things forward? And what can I eradicate the uh, things that I'm worrying about that I'm in no control of? If you're not hitting your target, do more prospecting. If you are wanting to get build your, your show out, Jermaine, start filming some content, put it online. And uh, I don't think it's any more complex than that, right? Yeah, and you got like I said, I I love the uh, focus on what you can control and just do little things. They don't have to be massive things. We keep having in mind that we have to do massive things. Sometimes, you know, uh, it's just doing the little things. Filming your first one minute video, you know, thirty seconds. Come on, Jermaine, you can do it. Thirty seconds, man. Put that thing on video. Put it down on video. You know, and then just going from there and just building up. And I think that's. But I love what you said earlier also that uh, people aren't really paying attention to you but they're paying attention to your content. And if you deliver great content, you will make an impact. Go Amazing Jermaine. Stuff. Amazing. Jermaine, I'm right back, Jermaine. We'll see. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll, um, I won't kind of commit Victor to this, but I'll help you out if you need, if you have any questions about this and uh, you want me to coach you with anything. So we'll get that rocking and rolling. Well, with that, Victor from myself, that has been this week in sales. I'll wrap up by saying, if you want to ask a question, leave your question in the comments below this video. You can email me, will at salesman.org with your questions as well. And Victor, do you want to share your email address in case anyone wants to get in contact with you? Victor at victorantonio.com. Amazing stuff. And we'll speak with you all again next week. 